Hey guys, Joe Drake here from the Axiom Fitness Academy and I want to break down one of the uh, foundational important concepts, whether you're going through the NASM personal training curriculum or the NSCA or the ACSM, it doesn't matter. The three planes of motion are a fundamental pattern of human movement and you're going to find them no matter what certification you're going through and really honestly just important for application when it comes to training. And the idea of getting people moving in different directions, not just because that's how we move in daily life, but also when it comes to exercises and training, it's a great way to make sure that we're not overtraining one pattern too much without providing some solid use of some of our assistance and accessory muscles that are so important for daily life and performance, right? So what I wanna do is I wanna go through each of those three planes of motion. Make sure you guys really understand what exercises, what types of movements fit into those planes, because if you are studying for your personal training certification, which is what we're all about here at the Axiom Fitness Academy, trying to get you started in the industry, this is going to definitely be an important concept from a test taking standpoint. And then when it gets time to understanding programming, how you can go about looking at your program and making sure that you have some, uh, some balance in the routines that you're creating for people. Not that you have to be totally equal amongst all three planes of motion, but your understanding of all three is really important. So the first of our three planes of motion, and again, it's all about understanding in which direction in this environment, the universe around us that we're moving. If you think about it, in what direction do most exercises happen in more of a traditional gym setting? Right now, we're kind of in a, a lower equipment environment here at Intensity X3, a lot more you know, functional type training, not as many machines, but if you think about it, you're in the traditional gym, or just most exercises people do, what direction do they happen in? Right, they happen front to back. And I'll give you some examples. Let's think about bicep curls. Don't get me wrong, I love me some bicep curls, but front to back. We think about crunches happening front to back. Even for the most part, although we'll talk about when it comes down to understanding planes of motion at segmental pieces, meaning specific joints, we've gotta break it down a little bit more because for example, a squat, although much of a traditional squat, whatever type of squat, body weight squat, back squat, much of it is sagittal, you'll find we do have some other motion happening too. So uh, don't forget the fact that most motions in life are gonna be what we call multi-planar. And that's a combination of the two or the three, really. So first one is gonna be called the sagittal plane. Sagittal plane, right? And what I want you to think about, and this is a very easy way for you to remember it, is think about if you were stuck in a hallway, right? This weird world where you were stuck in a hallway and you could only go front to back, whatever it is. Think about any exercise you could do in that hallway would be more of a sagittal plane motion, right? So what could I do? If I'm standing there, I could lift one leg, right? I could flex the hip, I could extend the knee, I could go calf raises, or as you guys get into your material, more plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, that sagittal plane, front raises, right? This shoulder flexion and extension is going to be frontal plane, I could go into lunges, right? So you guys get the idea. Anything that's more of this front to back movement is gonna be what we call sagittal plane. Now, nothing wrong with the sagittal plane. Most people train primarily in the sagittal plane. Now, and I, it makes sense because for the most part, these types of movements we tend to be most stable in, um, which means we have the ability to really overload the body. Many of the machines that are in the gym, if you think about it, are going in that front to back plane, right? It's more of that sagittal plane. Uh, because we don't necessarily need as much stability and so we're able to really overload those muscles. That's great, that's great. But there's some other directions the body's meant to move so we don't wanna leave those behind either. An easy thing for you, especially from, I like to give little test strategies, when it comes to understanding movements because what you're gonna happen or what you're gonna see in certain certifications, whether it's NASM, NSCA, or whatever, it might be more reference to, you know, in what plane of motion is the hip moving when it goes into concentric uh, contraction or flexion at the hip, right? Well, okay, then I can think, all right, if I'm going back to my anatomical position and I think about hip flexion, I know that's kind of a front to back movement that's gonna be sat in the plane. A little trick for you is the fact that almost all flexion and extension, right? If we're talking about just anatomical movement, flexion and extension, almost all flexion and extension in the human body happens in the sagittal plane. All right, have the only real example of that is going to be this lateral flexion of the spine, and that brings us to our second plane of motion, right? So we kind of talked about sagittal plane, that's great, let's leave that behind. Now let's think, if I was stuck in a hallway and I could only move side to side, 
And that would be what we call our frontal plane, right? You can see same idea. If I'm facing away, I can only move side to side. What all could I do in that direction? That's gonna be called frontal plane, right? So we've got all those muscles, especially all the muscles on the sides of our body. We're like an onion, right? We don't have muscles in the front and the back. They wrap all the way around. We've got multiple layers. And so that gives us the ability to move laterally. So if I'm doing this lateral flexion of the spine, you know, I'm doing more oblique type exercises, that's gonna be frontal plane movement. If I go into lateral raises, right? I'm going abduction, adduction at the shoulder, that's gonna be frontal plane. You know, again, think about with the lower body too, right? It's kinda of easy if we're thinking about the upper body, reaching side to side, even lateral lunges, right? I'm stepping straight out to the side, and I'm getting some frontal plane motion. All those things are great right now, because now we're also starting to bring in, right? Especially in our lateral lunge, we're bringing in adductors, abductors, a lot of these, uh, you know, like outer muscles of the body, I say outer muscles, things like our abductors and adductors that although they may not always be the big prime mover in a uh, functional movement pattern, walking, running, uh, or an exercise, they're definitely really important synergistic and stabilizer muscles. And us making sure we train them appropriately is gonna not only make sure that we move a little better, um, if we're an athlete, it's gonna make sure we perform better too, because most movement happens in these different directions, right? You think about it, think about an athlete on the field, very few times are they just in this perfect little squat. They're bending, they're going side to side, right? So we wanna make sure that we train people in these different motions, because the truth is, if they don't do it with us, they're not likely to be doing it, right? Not too many people day to day when they're in the office are just there doing these lateral lunges, right? So frontal plane, I think you guys have a good feel of that, right? So we think about a joint specific and then overall direction the body's moving like when it comes to locomotion. Our third plane of motion, probably one of the most undertrained um, or maybe mistrained would be the transverse plane. The transverse plane, it's all about rotation. So very easy to think about when we're thinking about the core and the spine because this would be our rotary exercises, right? So whether I'm thinking Russian twists, whether I'm thinking med ball rotations, so rotation. And as you guys get into your materials, they'll talk about axis rotation. Sometimes that can get a little uh, tricky and confusing, but think about this. As far as transverse motion goes, if there was a pole coming down from the ceiling and down through the ground, what motions could I do around that? Now again, very easy to think about with the spine, but where else do we have transverse motion in the body? So for one, think about it. Our shoulder joint, right, this glenohumeral joint, and uh, our femur, right, they're, they're very similar, ball and socket joints. So because of that, they allow for a lot of motion. So we do internally and externally rotate at our shoulder, right, in that joint. We also have internal and external rotation at our radius, radius and ulna. So we get this supination holding the ball of souk. We get this pronation, so we do have some transverse motion there. We also have some transverse motion in the hip with this external and internal rotation. And then as a whole, right, if I think about even moving my body, I can involve the hips as well as I rotate out and around and grab something to create more of an overall transverse motion. You know, you can think about it. Band, cable chops, lots of things we can do. So it doesn't mean you have to have an even amount of all three of the planes of motion, but I think it's more of an awareness of the different directions that the human body was meant to move. And, uh, and as you guys get into, although it's not as important for understanding just what the three planes of motion are, um, but when it comes to regressions and progressions, just keep in mind that as we start to add movement in different directions, we start adding planes of motion like frontal and sagittal, many times with an exercise, that's gonna be considered a progression because for so many people, it's kind of an unknown variable they're not used to. So the reason I say that is as we look about you know, trying to progress our clients long term, you know, maybe we're doing some sort of squat with weight and then we wanna add more weight and add a rotation at the same time, just make sure that you're only adding one of those variables at a time because those planes of motion do add some additional stresses, range of motion and muscles that we might not have been using in just our sagittal version of that exercise. So lots to go with that. I'm sure you guys can think about, just start thinking when you guys are in the gym, when you're training, what plane of motion is this joint moving in? Um, and even the way that I look at it, even with clients, when it just comes to mobility and flexibility, it might not mean that you've got to do an entire workout of transverse motion. And in fact, you probably shouldn't because for a lot of people, if they're not used to that, that can really overwork a lot of things. But it might be that, you know what, I want to make sure that at least in my dynamic warmups, maybe in some of my accessory movements in my workout, that I am starting to include some more frontal plane 
and some more transverse plane activities because it's just one of those things that most people aren't going to train a lot on their own and they just may not have the, uh, the understanding of how to do. But that's where you come in with the value as a personal trainer and coach. So just wanted to give you guys a little bit more in-depth explanation of what the three planes of motion are, some ideas of exercises and movements that fit into those, and, uh, and don't lose sight of the fact that as you watch people day to day in the gym real life, many of the movements we do involve all three of those planes of motion. All right, best of luck with your training and your studying, and I'll see you again here at the Action Academy.